So next we have a panel. It's called Crypto Economics Trends. Our moderator today is going to be Jimmy Lenz. He's going to be talking uh, um, us through first about our partnership with Duke University. And then we're going to um, welcome our um, panelists to the stage. So please, Jimmy, if you would like to join us. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. How are you guys doing? No, really, how are you doing? I'm a professor. I can do this like all day long and I will start calling on you. Um, everybody's wearing name tags. It's so easy to do. Um, no, I'm really glad to be here. I'm, I am so happy that I had the opportunity to do this and was invited to, um, invited to be here with you guys. So one of the things that you didn't see on Rob's last slide, Rob, I don't know why it wasn't on your last slide. I did not see a Duke logo down there. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with that, but Sorry, yeah, that's okay. Um, so this is me. Um, I come from a, uh, a little bit non-traditional background for academia. Um, I started in finance like a hundred years ago, it feels like, uh, trading equities and derivatives and um, kind of uh, went through that. Um, I concentrated more on the uh, algorithmic side of things and the electronic trading side of things. and worked for uh, some big financial institutions, one that became Reuters USA, and my last role in industry was as uh, chief risk officer of the second largest brokerage firm in America. Um, it was the most boring place in the world. Um, and so I decided, hey, I'm going to get out of here and do something different. So um, I decided to um, move on and uh, put my education to, I think, a little bit better use at, um, at Duke University. Um, so I'm at the engineering school uh, at Duke. I um, run two of the graduate programs, the Master of Engineering in Financial Technology and the Master of Engineering in Cybersecurity. But in addition to that, um, I, and I have like phenomenal students. We, um, we welcomed 120 new students last week. Um, we are the largest Master of Engineering in Financial Technology program in the world. Um, I saw the U.S. News World Report um, rankings just came out, and Duke is uh, moved up 11 spaces. We are a top 20 engineering school in the United States. Um, Duke University, for those of you who don't know, is in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I did not go there. Uh, I went to uh, two other schools, the University of South Carolina for undergrad and Washington University in St. Louis for my graduate program and, uh, and my doctorate work. But, um, but I'm hugely, uh, I'm just so happy to be at Duke and being able to do some of these things. So some of you have asked, do you teach any blockchain courses? We teach a lot of blockchain courses. It is, I teach uh, one section every semester. I could teach four sections of every semester and still have a waiting list of 50 students. Um, in addition to the, the uh, courses that I'm teaching uh, or that we offer, um, I also offer a course on Coursera. Um, a blockchain course, kind of an entry-level course that's based on, lightly on the one that I teach at Duke. Um, the cool thing about that, people from around the world. I'm as likely to have students from Berlin as I am from Boston as Beijing. Um, and that's been a really, really cool experience. Um, again, it, it opens me up to, to people and thoughts from just around the world. But in addition to the, uh, to the courses that we're offering, um, including a Web3 uh, class, which I think we may be the only place in the world that offers something like that. Um, we have the Digital Asset Research and Engineering Collaborative. So we are doing open source research, research work in the digital asset space. Um, we do run a couple of blockchains uh, at Duke now, and we will be offering a uh, or hosting a Horizon Validator very soon, before the, uh, before the end of the uh, semester. Academics always think in terms of semesters. Um, and then um, we are now um, in the process of, um, of working on a, a faucet. Maybe Horizon partners with us, maybe, on a new faucet, um, which would be really cool uh, for um, test currency so that students can do more experiments that developers can use for new things uh, so we don't have to, uh, to uh, depend on some of the things that are out there now that are um, constantly kind of under attack and things along those lines. Um, so about a little bit about our students. All of our students are um, in engineering students. They're all uh, required to take programming and software engineering courses. 
All of our students come from quantitative backgrounds, really quantitative backgrounds. Uh, most of them are mathematics undergrads, mo double majored uh, math and computer science or something along those lines. But these are just some of, the, uh, some of the courses the students take. So why am I telling you this? Because most, many of you work for Horizon and you're going to be looking for interns. You're going to be looking, you have projects that you don't have resources to staff. We can do this for you. We want to partner with Horizon. Um, I don't know how else to say it. We are looking for opportunities to do stuff. Not only because I love Rob and the team here, but because I think you guys are doing the right things. You guys are moving in the right directions and you're not afraid to take chances. Sometimes you fail when you take chances, but sometimes you do great things. And so we really want to, we really want to do this. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities to work with you. If you have ideas, let me know. I'm, I'm easy to reach. Um, and I'm more than happy to, uh, to do that. So this is all I wanted to say um, beforehand. We're going to call our panel up here right now. We're going to talk about some of the things that, um, that are really interesting to me in the, in the ecosystem. So come on up. There you go. I'll go around this way. I'll go around this way. So um, I've already given my background, so you guys want to take like um, just a couple of minutes and give everybody your backgrounds real quick. There's microphones there. Sure, I'll start. Uh, Colin Jones, Head of Strategic Investments at Horizon Labs. Prior to this, I was a finance professor for most of my career, where years and years and years ago, Rob and I stood up a crypto course in a program I used to run, and then he left to do this like Zencash thing, and so I had to find a replacement, and it was... Uh, pretty much responsible for hiring Jimmy Lenz long ago when he was slumming it at South Carolina and before, <laughs> before he went on to Duke. Um, but yeah, that's my background and uh, excited to hear Jimmy's thoughts on tokenomics. Hey everyone, uh, John Camardo, product manager here at Horizon Labs. Uh, been here for about 15 months now. Prior to joining, I was at Capital One in commercial banking, uh, strategy, product, uh, a bunch of different things. Uh, but since then, have been here working on pretty much everything that we've done over the past year from ApeCoin, other side, uh, 11 Captains Club, and all the internal products that we're building. So very excited to be on this panel and chat with you all. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Otten. I'm filling in for Brian today. Uh, I'm also on the strategic investments team with Colin at Horizon Labs. Uh, prior to joining Horizon, I was working in uh, traditional finance, uh, doing fundamental credit and equity investing at Aries Management, which is a global asset management firm. Um, excited to talk with everyone today. Hi, everyone. Um, I come from the world of investment banking. Um, I currently work on tokenomics and sort of tokenomics design for um, the clients that we launch NFTs and, and fungible tokens for. Hey, I'm uh, Domenico Cusimano. I um, am a product manager on the smart contracts team. Uh, I've been working on a lot of the NFT projects that we've been working on, tokenomics, things of that nature. Really interested in figuring out uh, where the market is going and uh, what these NFT creators really need uh, and uh, advising them on that and really trying to understand tokenomics from a incentive plot, like, ways we could really incentivize use cases there. And uh, I think it's still the beginning stages, but we're like really unraveling like how to properly uh, build something that people are going to use. So everybody's looking at this saying, wow, a whole panel full of bankers and economists. This is going to be freaking exciting. <laughs> no, I promise it will. Just stay, just stay tuned. It will get exciting. Um, so. I've done a bunch of research and we've written a couple of papers on different things on, uh, you know, incentives and uh, some of the things around tokenomics, but even beyond that to, uh, to some extent. And one of the things that we found was that uh, digital assets in particular behave a little bit differently. And one thing in particular that I always see the analogy out there, uh, especially by lazy uh, journalists, is that crypto is just like the dot-com bubble. I hear that constantly. So we actually did a, a fair amount of research and found it's, it's absolutely nothing like the dot-com bubble. There are very, very few analogies that you can draw. Um, and, and so one of the things that we found was that when, um, when we see 
the, the price of crypto go down, we actually don't see people fleeing like we do other assets when there's a downturn. We, we see just the opposite. Um, we see people coming into it. Um, and, and that's one of the indicators that I've been looking for to kind of gauge the health of crypto. So I'll, I'll throw it to, um, well, to the to two, two people here. Uh, I'll start with Colin first. You know, are there anything that you're using to gauge that kind of the health of the, the crypto environment? You had to start with me. That's well, yeah, a, I thought so. A, I mean, a, why not? That's, yeah, no, no, sure. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's a big question. Everybody's big. trying to address it. Um, we're looking at a lot of things without giving away secret sauce, but I think we're looking at it uh, in, our, in our day to day as individual uh, assets, and you know that that gets down to the tokenomics of the supply and demand. So we're thinking a lot about demand models and factor based stuff, uh, not so much at the overall crypto level. I work for a crypto company, so we are bullish on crypto just <laughs> by default. Um, so I'll turn it over to somebody else. But if they have a more macro look at it, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can look at, you know, various token prices and see, oh, they're down 80%, and you might think that, like, oh, that's, like, something's wrong, right? But I don't really think that's the case, right? I think, to a certain extent, there might have been somewhat of a, like, a COVID inflation in some of the prices of cryptocurrency, right? Because if I get a $700 check that I wasn't expecting, I might throw it in something like Ethereum, right? And that could have caused some, some price bump there. And so I think there's potentially some normalization from, from that standpoint. And then also, I think, you know, with, with, with interest rates going, going up so much kind of across the board, right? Like, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that cryptocurrencies, like their true utility and use cases are pretty long dated, right? I think like people say at 2030 is like when it might become like, under, like underpinning the global economy. And so with interest rates going up, you're having to discount these long dated cash flows back at a much higher rate. And so like the value they can generate in 2030 isn't changing, but like the risk appetite is going down, so you're seeing prices come down a bit. So I think it's, there's nothing wrong with the projects themselves, just kind of the macro factors are kind of causing some short-term price depression, in, in my opinion. So I'm glad that you brought up the interest rates, because I mean, obviously, you know, crypto and, and blockchain itself is, has never experienced a high interest rate environment. And, and we're going there, uh, you know, we're, we're there. Uh, the Fed is doing things to ease, but uh, you know, by the end of the year right now, futures are looking like probably Fed funds rate around 4%, so still significantly above where we are now. So John, you worked for Cap One. They, they're a credit card company. They, they manage interest rate risk like nobody else. What do you think about the interest rate environment um, you know, and, and how that could affect crypto in the, in the short term and midterm? Um. I'm actually not an expert on this at all, so uh, well, wing it. I, Come I, on. What, what I do, what I can tell you for certain is that my NFT investments have pretty much all gone to zero, and that's been at the uh, sort of result of this uh, rising interest rate environment. So uh, that's the extent to which I can talk about interest rates. How about you guys? What do you think in this in this interest rate, you know, rising interest rate environment? So I do want to talk a little bit about the parallels to the dot com. Uh, bubble. I do think there are parallels. Um, the thing that I think about is that with blockchain, I think the reason why people don't flee is because people have like a very strong conviction in the technology. Uh, and I think with any craze, you're going to have like these ups and downs. But um, yeah, that's the thing I was going to say about that parallel. But with I am not a finance guy. But um, I'm very interested in, in like uh, financial instruments. So I do think that with the interest rates, they are going to rise. I do think that crypto is also attached to the equities market a lot more now. So it might go down more, in my opinion. But um, I think you also have to take into account, like, is the Fed capable of matching the inflation rate with the amount they're like, going to increase the interest rate? Yeah, and I, I just think that crypto is much stronger, stronger of like an inflation hedge than, uh, you know, some of the, the whether the dollar is going to be able to maintain its strength. Well, it's interesting you bring up equities because one of the things that we've noticed in in research, in particular around Bitcoin, so most research that we've done has been tied to Bitcoin just because it has a lot more data points than than other currencies and a little bit longer dated. But one of the things that we've noticed is that when the price goes up. Volatility increases, which is totally different than any other asset class. No other asset class do you experience that kind of thing. Prices go up, volatility increases. It's usually just the opposite, right? 
Any, any thoughts by any of you guys why, that, why you think that's occurring? Come on, Colin. Yeah, I'm going to dodge that one and jump back actually to the interest rate question because I yeah. thought that oh, was the interesting. Rate. Okay, you can go backwards. So, you can go backwards. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, I have to be careful not to give an investment advice because I already got yelled at today for that. So <laughs> this is kind of a hot take. But if you think about, you know, the Fed's going to raise rates and crush demand, and I don't know if they have the appetite to do that, but they're saying they do. And then they're going to raise these rates. And, um, you know, when you think about blockchain and crypto and the use cases and how it's going to revolution, if, you, if you're here at this conference, you think it's going to revolutionize everything. Who gives a crap about 2 versus 4% Fed funds? Right? It seems ridiculous to me. So to look at these prices, I actually am super bullish, um, personally, not speaking for Horizon Labs, on, on this <laughs> asset class, that if you think uh, these use cases are going to disrupt every industry, and I think they will, then this was an amazing time to buy. And we're super excited to deploy capital in this environment. Um, is because who cares if the interest rates four percent? And Matt, Matt's math makes work on the right. discounted cash flows, but those numbers are huge at the end. And uh, four versus two versus six, uh, to me, it's a little irrelevant. So, yeah, no, I, I agree with you, uh, Matt. What do you, I, I see? You, I, it sounds like you, it looks like you have something to say about it. Eh? Oh no, I, I agree with everything thing that Colin said. Right, like people can be very short-sighted in the short term, and like people might be saying, oh, all these up, like the prices of you know like big blue chip equity companies like Shopify, right? It's yeah. a great company, like they're down more than Ethereum, right? So I think people can kind of overreact in the short term, but I agree with Colin, like in, in a couple of years, right? Interest rates aren't gonna matter because people are gonna kind of wisen up to the true, like the massive opportunity and the massive value that these can create. So, so one of the things that I've, I've noticed is, you know, more and more um, we're, I don't think we've topped out, but certainly user interfaces make sometimes investing in uh, cryptocurrencies difficult, um, in particular for you know, older people. So for, if you look at a wirehouse firm, so Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo Advisors, those kinds of places, their average customer is 60 years old. They're at retirement age. Um, and, and why is that? Why are they the, the majority of customers? Well, because that's where the money is. And, and those people are less likely to, to invest. Now, they're starting to get opportunities to do that via places like Vanguard. Um, you can start, you know, I think they have eight cryptocurrencies and they're going to expand it a little bit. Um, or they can invest via some of the ETFs. Now, one of the things that we've noticed is, you know, there's a pretty big divergence between prices and the ETFs. Do you think that's still a good investment opportunity for people or, uh, or, or a way to get exposure? So um, it's interesting that you talk about like uh, UX and bringing new people on board. I think that what's interesting about Horizon is that Horizon Labs has an opportunity that like we're a for-profit for company. So I think the problem with a lot of like decentralized products is that, you know, they're not thinking about the user enough, you know. So if we're able to focus on that a lot more, we could bring an adoption. Uh, when it comes to ETFs and things of that nature, my personal opinion is that um, like on Vanguard, they're, they're, they don't know as much about crypto as we do, so we could serve that audience a lot better than them, in my opinion. Yeah, you're also um, not self-custodying your assets uh, with structured products like an ETF, um, and there's an argument there to have around self-custodying uh, you know, what you own. So. Um, I think there actually are decentralized uh, products out there from like uh, projects like Index Coop that uh, maybe fill that gap, but um, it's, it's difficult to uh, think in a maybe decentralized manner with more centralized and structured products, but at the same time probably help onboard more people to the industry. It's, you make trade-offs every single day around these things. Um, and sorry, maybe to your previous point around maybe the older generation in these traditional uh, uh, ecosystems. Uh, I think like NFTs have actually, I mean, maybe not for like a, the 60 year old, <laughs> but um, at least definitely for the younger generation, they've kind of brought about probably a step change in users, like new users into ecosystems. And they're great onboarding tools for people to get into self custody, like I say, and potentially DeFi and other things around the crypto ecosystem. Do you, th do you think most people really want to self-custody? So I look at um, places like JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley and Citibank and they custody for a living. I mean, yeah. they have 
literally billions of customers. I would say, you know, and, and I think that's, that's an opportunity for places like Horizon um, to work with, you know, work and, and to look for those kinds of products because I, I really don't think most people want to self-custody. Younger people might because it's kind of a cool thing. Yep. You know, but they're doing, like you said, 700 bucks, right? Um, if you have, you know, $7 million in retirement savings, you're not going to want to self-custody that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'd like to open it up to other people, but I think uh, you don't, uh, you, you don't, you don't want to have to self-custody until you have to, right? So in the case of exchanges uh, going down, especially in this last cycle, like Voyager and some others, um, it, it, it just it shows that maybe sometimes in like a budding environment like this, Self custody is it just shows the importance of it. Yeah, you know, I think there are, there are some opportunities. So one of the one of the things that uh, that a couple of people mentioned, I know uh, you're working on NFTs. Uh, so I uh, I actually have used NFTs for uh, course certificates. So the course I mentioned that I teach on Coursera uh, last year, I decided um, students were having kind of a tough time getting their certificates, and so uh, I minted uh, NFTs, and these are non-transferable NFTs and uh, dropped them to all of my students on Polygon uh, because it was a few dollars instead of a few thousand on Ethereum. Uh, and then sent them an email and said, hey, uh, switch your wallets. I already have their wallet addresses because that's how they submit their homework. Uh, switch your uh, wallet to Polygon, refresh it, and uh, it just went crazy. People just loved it. I think we're still the only university ever to do that. Um, it, a lot of people are talking about it and it's like, let's move to the next thing. Um, but NFTs have gotten very popular. Um, obviously, there's, there's more and more, you know, I think that's a really practical use case. I think some of the other things are eh, a little questionable. But what do you see as the, as the future, near term and, and then midterm? Yeah, no, that's great, actually. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about NFTs, and uh, I, I'm a big fan. I, I like unique things. I think we kind of uh, need to get past the uh, ethos of this, like, 10K kind of, PFP collection and then move into things like non-transferable NFTs that show things like participation and engagement. Um, that's what I'm looking for potentially and maybe when you match those two things like a tokenized community and then on-chain um, like proof of verification, uh, there might be really powerful um, use cases that you can leverage from combining those two things. Yeah, I think um when you think about NFTs, it's really just your, the real like uh, importance behind it is that it's a proof of authenticity, right? And that is very important for a lot of industries. Uh, I think the, uh, the opportunity for this to kind of go to the next level is figuring out how to make that really easy enough so that the end user might not even need to know that it's an NFT they're interfacing with. So if you're buying a ticket from somewhere, it's just about uh, making that interface very easy to use. So if you're buying a ticket for an event, it's just that you actually have an NFT, but you just don't even know it. And that's how you're able to kind of transfer that ownership from one place to another. And that's very uh, important for, you know, if you think of like an event or like a ticket reseller, they're losing a lot of money on scalping and things of that nature. But um, at the end of the day, we also want the end user to have to be able to make money if they wanted to resell their ticket. But um, the thing is, it's mutually beneficial. So if you could figure out how to solve that problem, I think you, know, you could be very successful with that. And it solves like a real market need. I think that's the, the most important thing too. It's like figuring out what the market need is and like building for that. So all you developers, architects out there, you've heard like five people up here say, user interface, easier user uh, experience, you know, that, that would be awesome. One of the things I think, in, in, in my opinion, that's uh, kind of constrained DeFi in particular is the fact that the user interfaces suck. Um, they, if, if, you, if I was going to design a bad user interface, it would be, you know, almost every DeFi protocol there is. So, you know, there, there are so many opportunities out there. I mean, for Horizon, that's like, to me, that, that should be, you know, that should be the goal. That should be on top of everything, is user experience. Uh, so, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we're doing it right now with uh, the ape staking platform. I think uh, people look on Twitter, uh, even the sort of demos and the explainers that have been put out, um, 
kind of blown a lot of the viewers and community away from how uh, elegantly things are looking and shaping out to be. So I think that's definitely going to be one to look, and I think will probably set a precedent of uh, DeFi platforms uh, once this launches because we're putting a lot of time and effort into it. And uh, I think it's going to be a pretty successful product that we're building out. Okay, 30 seconds to give your last words. Me? 30 seconds. Everybody, everybody, 30 seconds. Yeah, um, 30 seconds. Last, last thoughts. If you don't have any thoughts, that's fine. I'll just echo the UI, the yeah. user interface, as being the incredibly com uh, important component to the, the next wave of adoption. So the pressure is on Dom to, to do an amazing job. But you're right about DeFi. It's, it's scary. Yeah. Nobody's going to use that except yeah. for the whack jobs, right? Yeah. So then, uh, and it, it needs to improve. Yeah. But there's a lot of value to be had. And so I think that that's going to be the next wave of adoption is if we can just make it friendly yeah. and, and a lot safer. Absolutely. John? Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to harp on the, the UI UX thing as well. I think uh, the biggest opportunity I see that we have is trying to bridge the gap between Web 2 and Web 3. The reality is that most of the people we probably want to deal with or haven't yet reached are people who maybe don't trust technology, don't trust the technology. And so doing everything we can to kind of bridge that gap, I think it's going to be super important and a huge, huge uh, opportunity for us as a company. Yeah, on that, on that same note, like, there's a line in, like, the, the service and restaurant industry, like, serve every customer as if they were your mom, right? And I think it's kind of true here, like, this needs to be so easy to use that, like, my mom, who knows nothing about crypto, could figure it out and, and, and make it work. So I think that's what it needs to move toward. Love that. Uh, I would just like to see more uh, creative NFT use cases and NFT projects come into the market. So, yeah, I think um, there's a lot of problems that blockchain could solve for people. So if you figure out how to solve those problems and just focusing, like UI is really focusing on the user and solving problems. So I think at the most foundational level, that's probably where uh, the focus should be. With that, we are out of time. Thanks very much, everybody. I really appreciate these lives. <laughs>